Good afternoon and welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 3rd of June and this week, this week's or this month rather, non-farm payrolls webcast with me Michael Hewson and my colleague in Canada, Colin Szynski. Good basically, morning Colin, everyone. Good morning. So um, basically Colin and I will basically be taking you through the key numbers, hopefully trying to give you an indication as to what to expect from the numbers, but before we do that, we have to get a little bit of housekeeping out of the way first. And that would be the risk warnings which we have to display at the beginning of any one of these presentations because ultimately um, we can't give trading recommendations. Anything that we do here is, 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 is none of it's advisory. It's basically perceptual more than anything else. And um, it's there for it's there for your um for your benefit. So once I've displayed the risk warnings and got them out of the way, we can pretty much get started right now. So non farm payrolls. We've heard an awful lot, I think, of jaw boning, speculation, what have you, from Federal Reserve members since the since the since the May number or the April number rather. Um, a month ago about um, the timings or otherwise of a U.S. rate rise. Certainly expectations have risen of a summer rate rise from this time last month. And I think really the questions that we're going to be looking at today will be with respect to whether or not the Federal Reserve, based on these numbers, will pull the trigger on a rate rise in June, in less than two weeks from now. Um, certainly, I think that's the I think that's the perception that most Fed policymakers want to give the markets. They want to give them give people the impression that they're ready to pull the trigger, if not in June, certainly in July. Now, I personally think that June is highly unlikely, and certainly the bond markets would appear to agree with that if interest rate perceptions or expectations on my Bloomberg terminal. Are any guide, and I'll quickly, I'll quickly show them to you right now. Um, right on the screen in front of you is world interest rate projections or expectations. It's WIRP, and the number I'm particularly interested in is this number here, which is the probability of a rate hike. And at the moment, June is assigned a 20%. Probability. Now, that's not to say that they won't hike in June. There is a chance they could do it, and that number could well move in the wake of today's payrolls report. If we get a very, very good jobs number in excess of 190, 200,000, then certainly the odds will shift to a potential hike in June in less than two weeks. Um, but at the moment, the favourite looks to be July, and that's 55% um, probability of the Fed pulling the trigger on a rate rise in July. July doesn't have a press conference, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they won't pull the trigger on a rate rise. I think the biggest, I think the biggest obstacle to a rate rise in June is first and foremost the data. Some of the data hasn't been great. Yes, we've seen some decent home sales numbers. We've also seen some decent personal spending numbers. Certainly they came in at the best levels since 2009. But on the flip side of that, we've also seen some very disappointing manufacturing numbers. And the manufacturing numbers have been consistently disappointing. And I think that for me, I think, is going to be the, the key concern of Fed policymakers. So I know, Colin, you've got a perception that they might go in June, but with the UK referendum eight days later, and the fact that everyone is putting the fear of God into a British voter about the risks of leaving the EU, I can't believe that the Fed would, put, would raise rates eight days before that because it would send a message to everyone globally that the Fed wasn't that worried about the probability of a Brexit and ultimately that would undermine the whole narrative of Project Fear. 
I don't know yeah, I mean, there's been a, the, the fear campaign has really been ramping up uh, around the world over over the last little while. The Fed members have backed away from that uh, a little bit, but I mean, they could just turn around and, and blame it on the data. And I think that's why today's number is is particularly significant. And you're right. I, I think it would take for anybody to think that the Fed might hold off anytime soon. You'd need a number below 100, 100 to 200. They could go either way. And, and personally, I said about 50-50 on whether they raise rates in June or whether they use the June meeting to signal a July rate hike. And as you said, with the bonds, certainly, it's, uh, it, that, that's certainly the way the bond market's been acting. In, in my opinion, currency and, and stock markets are pricing in a rate hike in June or July. I don't think there's a real commitment in the market to either one, as long as they do one of them. And, uh, and then I, you're right, I mean, for them to really go and put pressure on them to move sooner would be a 200-plus kind of number. So I'm with you on that. The other, there are a couple of other... Uh, announcements this morning that are also significant later in the day that that people will want to be keeping an eye on we have uh, service pmi coming out for the uh, the united states is around 9:45 10 a.m. eastern time the uh, numbers from overseas have been pretty decent overnight uh, the uk australia japan showed some improvement another big one's factory orders at 10 a.m. eastern time michael's been talking about continued softness in the uh, in the manufacturing space so that one could get some attention and later today at uh, 12.30 Eastern Time, 5.30 p.m. in London, we have uh, Lael Brainerd talking. She's one of the permanent Fed voting governors, and of that group, she's the most dovish. And we've seen the hawkish rhetoric, or even uh, yelling, in her case, shifting the neutral, uh, building in, at the Fed over the uh, over the last month or so. So I'm considering her speech to be the dove's last stand. The uh, If she comes out uh, similar to Yellen, where she's just kind of wishy-washy, because you'd expect her to ever get, and but if she comes in a hardcore dovish, then that could be uh, intriguing. We had uh, some mixed comments out of uh, Chicago Fed President Evans uh, this morning uh, as well. He's been one of the more dovish members of the Fed uh, in the past. Uh, my my feeling on this is uh, on where the where see the payrolls number. There's a little bit of distortion, so it could get downplayed. The reason is there was a big strike at Verizon during the uh, the survey period. There's uh, 35,000 workers there were off work and they were on the picket lines, they could can't be counted as unemployed. So even though they're not really, they were on strike. So that could, uh, there could be a distortive effect uh, in the number as well. So we'll keep an eye on that. The street's about 160. I figured, okay, let's take half the uh, Verizon workers. So uh, accounting. So I went down to 145 and, uh, and I'm thinking you might get a, uh, a 10 K vision upward to last month, similar to what we had with the ADP number yesterday. And I'm going 130 just because I don't want to be on the same number as you. So, <laughs> uh, but it's also the so that's fully that, counting uh, the Verizon strike. Yeah, <laughs> but there's also the fact that the manufacturing data that we've seen, the regional manufacturing data, has been absolutely shocking. Um, if you look at the Empire Fed, you look at the Philadelphia mm -hmm. Fed, you look at the Dallas Fed, you look at the Chicago PMIs, they've been all really, really poor. Uh, and that's why when we saw the ISM manufacturing number out, earlier this week, I was actually surprised at how positive it was. But actually, when you drilled down into the detail, it was the, the employment component was, was below 50. And the Chicago PMI employment component was even worse. So I think if you replicate that across in terms of the employment components, I would be very surprised if we saw uh, a number in excess of 164. Um, that's not to say it won't happen. I mean, let's face it, at the end of the day, that's what markets are about, differences of opinion. Um, but ultimately, I think the big question at the moment is what's going, to pr what's going to push the dollar up, what's going to push the dollar down? I think anything above, as I said earlier, anything above 190 will push the dollar up and raise expectations of a rise in June. I still don't think it'll happen, but it'll raise expectations of a rise in June. And a number of anywhere, anywhere south of 150 will give pause for thought, I think, with respect to a, a June rate rise and potentially uh, push that off into July. And you've got to bear in mind that we haven't really seen any significant improvement in the data apart from home sales data last month. And that came about, I think, as a result of the fact that the Fed had been so dovish and the expectations had been so low that there wouldn't be any rate rises this year. Well, if you're confident that the rate rates aren't going to go up in the short term, 
um, very, very quickly, you might be more incentivized to buy a new house or buy, uh, buy you know, buy, buy a, you know, a, a, not a, a used house, but a replacement house because you know that your mortgage costs are going to stay constant. So I'm thinking that maybe that spike in home sales could have been as a result of the fact that everyone thought that home sales, sorry, that, that, that rates were going to stay low for the rest of this year. That narrative has shifted. So I'll be interested to see whether or not that's sustained into um, this month. Be interesting to know. Anyway, let's get onto the subject of key levels. Let's first and foremost make a start with the S&P 500 because I think, you know, we we, we want to talk we want to talk about that. And certainly in terms of the actual oscillator here, we've got massive areas of resistance here in the S&P. We're running into them right now. 2116, um, the highs in November. 2137, the highs in May last year. Um, and also the highs in April. So we are sort of pushing at the upper boundaries of where we think, you know, markets are valued. And ultimately, I'm a little bit cautious about being long stocks at these levels. That being said, these very also long Michael, shadows. That's... Oh, sorry, I just want to mention, if it doesn't break out soon, that's looking like a double top as well. So we've got to be yeah. careful with that. And you're overbought on the stochastics. Sorry, go on. But also the long shadows on these three daily mm -hmm. candles suggest there's plenty of demand above 2085. So we really need to get back below 2085 because every t or 2088. Because every time we've tested around that area, we've closed quite well away from the lows. So that tells me there's plenty of built-up demand and it suggests that maybe we're in a little bit of a range at the moment. But you're right, the, the, the stochastic is oversold. doesn't necessarily mean it can't go any higher. Let's quickly do the US 30 because it's a similar sort of story. The Dow Jones 30, again, we've got significant resistance levels, but also we've got the fact that um, the oscillator is, again, very, very overbought on the short term. But we actually haven't got anywhere near the previous highs. In, in April that we did on the S&P. So there's a little bit of what I would call divergence there in terms of pushing higher on the Dow. And that's also a little bit of a warning sign as well. UK 100, very, very quickly. Similar sort of story. We've got very solid support at 60, 50, 60, 60. But look at the peaks. The, the, the peaks are getting lower and lower. So again, that's a suggestion that unless we break above 6280 on the FTSE 100, then we could well start to drift lower. Let's quickly have a quick look at the dollar story because dollar yen has been looking very, very soft. Um, certainly in the context of this particular chart, we've stayed below this resistance level here. Um, nice little double, resist, double tap on the resistance there. Really need to get back above 109.20, 109.30 on dollar yen to push lower down towards that 106 area. That's a very, very key support level in the short to medium term. Um, I would certainly think there's potential for a little bit of support in and around this sort of area here, 107.60, 107.70. So in the event of a poor number, which is anything less than, say, 150, we could get a push lower on dollar yen. Certainly the direction of travel does appear to be there. Um, anything else you want me to cover before we go on to other currencies? Euro dollar, big, big level here, ladies and gentlemen, on euro dollar from the December low. That's a trend line there. 200 day moving average there and the trend line there. That's 111. Okay, so keep an eye on 111 in the event of a good number because if we get a good number, euro dollar will drop very, very sharply. Same sort of thing applies to cable, right on a very key support level, but again, a nice big trend line there coming in around about 142.80, 143. Also, the 100-day moving average, you know, we are, we are in a little bit of a range here. Look at these series of lows through here. So we could get a move down to around about 143.20, which is the May lows. That's the key level in the event of a good number on cable. Um, last but by no means least, going to quickly do Aussie dollar. Um, I've just been asked if I think Brexit will have any bearing on the Fed's call. Yes, I do, most definitely, and that's why I don't think they will go in June. I think they will wait to see the outcome of the Brexit vote. Um, big, big, big resistance on Aussie dollar at 73. So again, a poor number. Keep an eye on the resistance level on Aussie dollar. That does appear to be looking as if it could be about to break higher, the Aussie. And I think, bearing in mind that the RBA have a meeting next week, 
Um, there is an expectation perhaps that they might be a little bit dovish. I'm not sure that they will, not after that very positive GDP number that we saw earlier this week. I think they're going to hold back on any potential further rate cut speculation. They're already at record lows at 1.75% and I don't think they're going to go beyond that. So we're into the 15 second countdown and I can take a deep breath and uh, we can all get ready to go for the numbers. So here we go and I'll just keep quiet and let you absorb the numbers. 38. Oh, that's really oh, a low. Word. Wow. That is, that is an awful, awful number. And that means, and revision, look at the revision, Colin, 123. Huge revision down. It's revision down. Look at the loss of manufacturing. The unemployment rate, though, look at the unemployment rate, 4.7%. That's bizarre. I mean, that's bizarre. just incredible. So what's happened to the participation rate? The participation rate has dropped as well. So that's a little bit of a false impression there of the unemployment rate. The unemployment rate has dropped, but that's because people have dropped out of the workforce. Look at dollar yen. Look at it go. I was too conservative with respect to my call there. So that's a very, 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 very weak number. 38,000 non-farm payrolls. Massive We've miss. Got, yeah, huge miss, and the markets are diving off that. We've got the S&P back under 2,100 already, so we are getting hit pretty hard here. And yeah, then that's so pretty much across the board. I was looking that like everything's getting hit. Fed's off. So basically there will be no rate hike in June. And actually, looking mm -hmm. at it, I think unless we get a decent number in July, you can write July off as well because that is, that is really, really unexpected. The only, the, only, the only sort of positivity that I can take out of that is the unemployment rate dropping to 4.7%. But the... the the participation rates drop from 62.8% to 62.6. So that means that essentially the number of people in the workforce has declined, and that's why the unemployment rate has, has dropped. When people come back into the workforce, the unemployment rate generally tends to go up because then they're officially classified as looking for work. So, 38,000. Well, I'm absolutely speechless with respect to that. I certainly didn't That's think that way one worse coming. than I thought it was going to be. Way worse than I thought. I mean, to be quite honest, you can even forget about the wage growth numbers, the average hourly earnings, because they came in at 2.5% annualized year on year and rose 0.2%. So even accounting for wages, wages growth, I think this number is going to give the Fed significant pause for thought when it comes to their deliberations. When they um, when they meet in just under two weeks' time, and so yeah, it's certainly think, enough to get them to stop for June. Yeah, um, you certainly look at what Miss Yellen Janet Yellen's talking on Monday. It'll be very interesting. I think it'll be very interesting to hear what she has to say with respect to that. I mean, because even if you take the Verizon numbers out of that payrolls number, it is still a shockingly poor number. And Absolutely. Fact, and 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 the fact that you've got a 123k revision downwards. To the, to the to the April numbers yes. means that the U.S. economy is not just slowing down in Q2; it's potentially coming to a halt, and that is really quite significant. Now you could flip that around. Um, the May telecommunication payrolls dropped 37,000. Just seen that. Just seen that. Just get uh, just get tweeted by MNI. So I'm just going to retweet that right. Oops, that's the wrong one. That's the trouble with scrolling tweets. If you're not quick enough, um, you, you you get you get the wrong option. So, so basically, that's going to send. Obviously, oh, you're absolutely right, sir. That's going to send gold higher, most definitely, on the back of that. And let's look at let's look at the key levels. And we, we I must admit we forgot to look at gold, but uh, that tells you all you need to know. Really, big support around yeah. gold. Yeah, gold was starting to pick up really good support around 1,200, and it's been working its way back upwards. So it looked like the the, the sell-off was kind of winding down in gold anyways, and it's already been starting to bounce back. So basically across the board, weaker dollar. Weaker dollar means lower dollar yen, higher euro dollar, higher cable. So those key support levels that we were talking about just before we 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 got the numbers, they've worked quite well. Certainly the 111 area on euro dollar has worked like a charm. 
certainly in the case of this area here. And certainly I think in terms of the oscillator as well, that gave us some clues as to the directional turn that the markets may well have taken. You know, this is I think this is one of the reasons why I generally like to look at look at charts, technical analysis and oscillators. It's to be able to identify potential turning points in the market and try and extrapolate a scenario that will ultimately um, determine the next directional move. And certainly if you think Euro dollars in an uptrend and you're approaching a key support level, what you then or what I then do is I think to myself, well what scenario would cause Euro dollar to go up? Or would cause Euros to go up and dollars to go down? And ultimately it would be a bad payrolls number. So we were talking anything less than one fifty would send the dollar lower. And that's precisely what happened. Though I have to say um, 130,000, I was very, very conservative. I should have gone 30,000 instead, shouldn't I? But hey, I was, a, I was 100 out. Um, but obviously, in terms of what this does for currencies, is it means that a weaker dollar is likely to be the, the, the next scenario. So if we look at, say, Canadian dollar here, we've had a look at this. Um, and again, we've got a nice little resistance level all the way through these peaks here didn't get to show you this, but we have got support also coming in on these lows here that we saw at 129 towards the end of May. So certainly on the basis of that number, we're probably going to see the Canadian dollar, the dollar CAD, the Canadian dollar strengthen and the US dollar drop towards the lows that we saw at the end of May. In terms of, let's get rid of these now, I just don't need these anymore, and these and Dave, and um, then move on to the Aussie dollar because we, we talked about that a little bit uh, earlier on in that 73 level and there we are, we're right pushing against it now on the Aussie dollar and that does appear to suggest to me that there's a potential base building formation building up on the Aussie and we could well see a move back towards around about 75 cents over the course of the next week or so on that. I, don't, I think I think it's safe to say that there's probably not much in the way of positives in terms of this jobs report. And certainly I think if we look at, say, dollar yen now, we're pretty much going to be heading back towards these lows here, um, which we saw which, which in the line which I drew in, drew in earlier. And then potentially we could see a move back towards 106. Now obviously that's not going to be, it's not going to be, um, go down particularly well with the Bank of Japan. And um, uh, their, 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 their wishes for a weaker yen, but ultimately what the Bank of Japan wants and what the Fed wants are um, unfortunately completely at opposite ends and ultimately the Fed will win. Um, you've heard of the saying, don't fight the Fed, but uh, I think that's a, that's a truism that you do well not to ignore because um, when it comes to US interest rate expectations ultimately, um, the, the, they're the central bank that essentially makes the world go around. So dollar yen, the direction of travel here, certainly if we look at the way this resistance level has been going, does suggest that while this is trending lower, the dollar yen will go lower. This is called an Ichimoku chart and this is something that I use um, for my analysis in trying to identify where dollar yen is headed next. So when we pushed against this resistance level at the end of May, I was of the opinion that there was going to be a very, very tough level to get through and even if we did, we had a significant resistance level coming in around about this level here. So it stands to reason the US economy may not be as healthy as people think that it is. Me being the overall cynic about these sorts of things, I'm, I'm a little, I'm not surprised that it's slowing down but I am surprised at the extent to which it has done. So I mean that can mean one of two things, it can mean a tight, very, very tight labour market or it can mean that um, the economy is starting to grind to a halt. Um, Colin, do you, is there anything you, you want to look at? Oh, we're going to talk about Brent, weren't we? Are you there, mate? Well, he's not. Okay, sounds like my colleague Colin has uh, gone absent without leave, so I will carry on talking. Um, let's have a quick look at Brent crude. Um, certainly a approaching some very key resistance level here. We're having a great deal of trouble around about this $50 a barrel mark. Certainly yeah, it's really struggling here. Oh, you are there. I wonder where you've gone. 
Oh, I've just gone off to do the inside and back. Sorry. Oh, okay. All right. I was just talking to you then. Okay. So, um, so I'll, I'll let you jump in here, Colin, and carry on with the, uh, the Brent crude if, if, you, if you want to. Absolutely. Thank you, Michael. The, uh, the Brent crude is, and, and WTI really are both struggling at about the $50 level. It's a huge psychological barrier, and, and, and not only is it a big round number, but also we're getting pretty close to doubling off the bottom in and around the 54. So a lot of people are taking stock here with, with crude. It's come back a long way, but the question has been now what's going to push it higher? Well, one of the things that's been, that's been helping crude lately has been uh, – feeling that there'd be growing U.S. demand and that the U.S. supply demand was coming back in balance. So U.S. production has been slowing, demand has been picking up, and that's been bringing down the inventories. And it was interesting yesterday when uh, we saw the, how, how much the U.S. really has taken leadership away from OPEC when we had the, uh, the OPEC once again fail to come to an agreement on anything, just like it did back in April. But when you look at this chart and you look where did uh, – that the, the uh, that when OPEC meeting fell apart in April, crude oil was at 40. It's now at 50. It's the U.S. that's been driving the bus on this market, both brand and WTI. So that's something we've got to keep an eye on going forward for the next few weeks. Now, for me, it's due for a consolidation anyways. You might get a little bit of a deeper correction now that there's some questions about the health of the U.S. economy. But if you look here at the stochastic, it has been rolling over so and, and back, under, uh, back under 80 here. So it wouldn't be a surprise to see a, a little bit deeper correction. So far, it's been trying to digest these gains by going sideways, but there is still the possibility we might get a pullback towards the, uh, towards maybe towards the 50-day average there. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's, that's my contention. I think we're overdone here. The market wants to go above 50, but I think ultimately it's, it's going to fail. And, um, you know, as such, I think once it, once it gets tired of trying to push the boundaries of a move higher, we're probably going to get a move lower. And I think the fact that, that, that crude oil is now starting to roll over, I think, is a certain element of shock at how disappointing that payrolls report number is and the fact that maybe the U.S. economy is not as strong as people think that it is. And ultimately, that feeds into a demand curve in terms of, well, if, if the U.S. economy is recovering, then demand is likely to pick up. These payrolls numbers suggest otherwise, and as a result, that's probably going to push crude oil lower, which means that any inventory is going to take longer to work off. And I think that's why crude oil is now starting to roll over, um, based based on you know just based on based on the, those facts there. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I mean a weaker dollar is absolutely a factor in terms of crude oil, and that's a very valid question. But um, I think the supply and demand dynamics trump the weaker dollar argument because ultimately the, the reason crude oil has been rallying, I've just been asked about, if anyone's asked, wondering why I've gone off at a tangent, I've just been asked a question about, well, surely a weaker dollar would push oil up. And that's a very valid argument. But obviously you've, also, you've got that argument, but you've also got the supply and demand argument. And Crude oil generally tends to rise on the back of perceptions of a recovering economy because a recovering economy generally people tend to travel more, uh, they tend to consume more. Um, and these payrolls numbers give the impression, mistaken or otherwise, that the US economy is coming to a very sharp halt in Q2. And that means that oil demand will drop, which means the inventory will take longer to build off or work off. And as a result, the glut will remain there for longer and as such this oil move then therefore has got slightly ahead of itself and will then feed into a slight pullback in crude oil prices so hopefully that makes sense the supply and demand in this on this occasion outweigh the weaker dollar argument so hopefully that makes sense um no worries okay so that's that's crude oil um Gold, we've, we've, we've done gold prices, and let me just quickly do WTI because we were looking at Brent there. But there's not that much difference between the two. Similar sort of story there. And again, and interestingly, this week, the, the earlier the, in the last few days, the spread at one point got down to a couple of pennies. It's pretty much uh, they're pretty much trading in tandem now, more or less. Mm, yeah. So it certainly does give um, <laughs> this, this this number certainly does uh, does give a. Uh, some pause uh, to that. Give some pause to that, and it gives some food for thought for uh, Mr. Kuroda at the Bank of Japan, most definitely, because mm -hmm. he's probably going to be spitting his sake out right now. 
Um, okay, so ladies and gents, does anyone have any other questions about anything that we've discussed thus far? Or does anyone want me to cover anything in particular? One thing I did notice, actually, just before we came on air, Colin and I were looking at this earlier, was there's a very nice reversal pattern mm -hmm. um, folding out in Sterling Aussie, uh, this one here. If we look at the weekly chart, and those of you who follow me regularly on Twitter or any of my videos will know that I do like bearish engulfing and bullish engulfing candles. Well, we've got a massive bearish engulfing candle here. And that suggests that potentially Sterling Aussie could be at risk of a sharp correction lower. What we've done here is this candle body has engulfed the body of the previous week. If we close on the lows, then the likelihood is we could see further Sterling weakness and Aussie strength. So the biggest question that really we then have to ask ourselves with respect to this is how does Sterling Aussie, how does the Sterling weakness Aussie strength fold, unfold? Will it be a move higher in the Aussie, a very strong move higher in the Aussie, or will it be as a result of a strong move lower in the pound? I would suggest, obviously, I think it's going to be a combination of both. What will happen is Aussie will go up and cable, it won't come crashing off, but what will happen is when, the, when, when sterling depreciates or appreciates against the dollar, it won't appreciate anywhere near as fast against the dollar as the Australian dollar does. If we look at what cable's been doing for the past six weeks, we've been in a 147, 143 range. We're slap bang in the middle of that at the moment, around 145. That will continue to be the case between now and June the 23rd. I see no reason why cable will not or should move out of that range between now and the referendum date because ultimately people will be very, very cautious about pushing cable hard in either direction while the, um, the, the uncertainty about the Brexit vote is um, still occupying most people's attention. So, Now, that being said, I think that within these ranges, you will get some significant bounces from day to day, and you could have you know, uh, big figure moves up or down, as we've seen already based on, on various poll results. And I think we'll see that kind of sideways choppiness continue over the next couple of, I guess, three weeks till we have the, till the referendum. Okay, so do you remember that um, chart on Bloomberg, ladies and gentlemen, that I showed you just before the payrolls numbers, the interest rate expectations post, pre the number, it was 20 oh, no, what's it down to now? Let's look at it now. Four. Four wow. So there's a 4% probability that um, uh, the Fed will raise rates in June, and 55 to 32. So... Slim and none, shall we say, between um, whether or not we'll get a rate hike in July. So that number, I think, has pretty much um, ruled out the prospect of a July rate hike as well, unless we get a significant blowout number in a month's time when we do the July payrolls. Okay, so that's it, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you very much for your time. I will be posting this um, webinar on YouTube sometime in the next 24 hours. Otherwise, I would like to thank you all for tuning in. And um, hopefully you will all tune in again same time next month. Otherwise, it's thank you from me and it's thank you from my colleague, Colin. Yes, thanks. Have a great day trading, everybody.